Good morning, everybody. Just invite you to take a few moments to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as Kay plays for us. Good morning, everybody. Christ is risen. risen Oh, that was good. I was expecting a little bit of delay because it's not Easter. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. risen Amen. Easter continues. Well, uh, we've got a a few announcements. Before we do, just want to welcome everybody online. Glad you're joining with us, uh, whether you're on YouTube or on our website streaming. Just want to remind you, if you have a prayer request, type it into the chat. And uh, our greeter, uh, which is Susan today, she'll make sure that gets to me in time for us to pray together. It's also Communion Sunday, so if you have a a, a cracker or a piece of bread or juice or wine nearby, go ahead and grab those, uh, because we're going to be celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper together here at the first part of the service. That way you're ready. Glad you're with us. Welcome. And to every one of you here, I just want to remind you, we have these connection cards that are either in the pew or back at the back table or this table. Um, You can write in your prayer request. If you'd like to stay connected with the church in any way, you can write that in as well. And as the offering plates come by, just slide that into the offering plate and that will get right to me. Uh, We have uh, some special guests with us this morning that we'll introduce later on in the service, but we have friends from Christian at Dartmouth campus. Um, They will be uh, sharing a little bit during the service and then after the service in Trumbull Hall, telling us more about their ministry. I'm very excited about what they're doing and I'm really, really happy they're here with us today. So welcome, and uh, we'll get to know you guys later on in the service. Uh, Rummage sale is this week. It's coming. Who started raiding their closets already? That's what I like. President of the Etna Ladies Aid Society right there. um, You can start dropping things off uh, on Tuesday, right? Nine to four? Five. Five. Sure. Drop things off right there in Trumbull Hall. Uh, and then, of course, um, the best thing about rummage sale is that you get to drop things off and then you get to take home new things. So uh, make sure you're coming this coming Friday, 9 to 1, and then Saturday. Um, nope, Friday, when is it? Friday, noon to 6, 9 to 1 on Saturday. Yep. See, you just can't beat it. You just can't be it. So come on. Uh, Alpha Chorus is winding, uh, winding up. We are in the last of three nights. Starting at, that's tonight at 630. Again, if you haven't made it out to Alpha, uh, come on. 
Uh, we have a good time. There's always excellent food. And we have a, an Alpha One Day Retreat uh, coming up on Saturday, April 20th. So if you're a part of Alpha, and you, or, or even if you're not, you want to just show up for the 20th, that's great. It'll be here locally at uh, Marjorie and Doug's house. So um, just let us know that you want to sign up, that you want to be there for that, and uh, it's going to be a good time. And the last thing I just want to... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you did it, if you were with us in Alpha during the fall and couldn't make it to the one day retreat, uh, it's a great time for you to come as well. Um, last announcement that I have, there's a slide coming up there and just say, Doug, can we skip to the next slide? This is more for um, the, the cool kids among us. Um, I'm not one of them. I just get to put my name up on there. No, we're going to do a, a new monthly thing uh, starting uh, next month where it's just going to be Ask Anything. So this is going to be for our middle school and high school students. Um, it'll be, it's probably going to be on a Wednesday night, uh, uh, an additional Wednesday night once a month. And it'll just be whatever. Whatever questions you guys have, there'll be a way for you to text in questions ahead of time. Um, and we'll answer questions live on the spot. Um, and we'll just see how that goes. I don't know how it's going to go. We'll see how it goes. It should be good. Um, all right. If you would, please stand with me as we open up our service in prayer. Great God in heaven, we thank you. Easter is not behind us. It truly is every day. We thank you that we stand in the resurrected life of the resurrected Son of God. Thank you that you've called us together this morning. Thank you that you have not forgotten us, that we are not a second thought, but your every thought bends towards in love toward us. And Lord, we are just so grateful to be able to gather in worship this morning. I pray, God, that as we've gathered, that your spirit would speak to us, that we would come closer to you, that you would draw us from wherever we are in relationship to you, that you would draw us at least one step closer to you today. That's my prayer, and I pray it with confidence because I know you love to answer that prayer. Lord, we love you, and we're so grateful for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Turn in your hymnal to hymn number 525. Words will be up on the screen, of course.
The first scripture reading is from 1 John. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the first scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 2. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one, who is life itself, was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing you these things so that you may fully share our joy. This is the message we have heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say that we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to ask our deacons if you would come, please, and prepare the table. As they do uh, prepare the table, I just want to read the, the, that portion of scripture to you again. This is John, the same John who had the revelation, the, the picture of the lamb that we talked about last week. He's writing to one of the churches that he was a kind of an itinerant pastor of. And he says this, and I just love this, and it's, it's worth uh, dwelling on just this morning, especially this morning. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. I love the honesty and transparency of this. We've talked a lot about how we can have the idea when it's time for church, we gotta put on fancy church clothes and, and kind of put on a, a front and pretend like we got it all together. I hope that, that there's not a trace of that among us anymore, if there ever was. Uh, but we, the, the scriptures are clear, we don't have to pretend otherwise either. You and I both know it, even if we didn't have this light to shine on our hearts, we know that we're sinful uh, people. And the great thing about Easter and what we're celebrating today at the Lord's table is that he covers all our sins. Not just the ones that you think are worth forgiving, not even the ones that you think are, are small enough that God can handle and you can get over. He covers all of our sins. And so that's what we're celebrating this morning. As we come to the table here, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I do thank you I do thank you that your grace is so good and so strong that it covers it all. That there is not anything, in, in our minds we have ideas of big sins and small sins, of, of things that are in public and things that are in secret. They are all the same to you. 
You see them all equally. And your blood shed on the cross, the love poured out for us, covers them all. So Lord, as we come to this table this morning, I pray that in our hearts, we would not have a a sentiment as though this is something that is in our past when truly this is something that is a present reality for each of us. We all have sinned and there are days when we do sin and your love for us shed on the cross covers it all. We come not because we're worthy. We come because you've called us and you've prepared a place for us at your table. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. It said uh, that on the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he passed it, he broke it, and he passed it around to his disciples. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Uh, Every time you do this, Remember me. Remember what I'm doing on the cross for you. Uh, And it's almost as though it's also not only a a remembrance like in memoriam, but also a celebration. He He went to the cross for you. He loved you that much. Deacons, if you would come, distribute the bread.
this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of the Lord. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is my blood that's poured out for you. Every bit for the last drop for you. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance. Lord, we thank you that you held nothing back. Lord, help us to live lives of not holding anything back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again.
We are going to dismiss our kids uh, with a blessing today. So if you would, let's read this together. <laughs> Almighty God, we turn our hearts towards our children who we welcome and value as members of your church. As their community of faith, may we believe in their potential and encourage them in their pursuit of their God-given destiny. May they grow in faith to love and serve you with all of their hearts. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with them today and every day of their lives. Amen. Amen. Kids, we love you. We're proud of you. You can follow your leaders. And at this time, Abby Fellows is going to come and uh, introduce our special guests. Well, the Missions Committee is absolutely thrilled to be able to team with a group that is serving as uh, missionaries to the Dartmouth campus working with students. Uh, Tim Pillsbury grew up in Hanover, New Hampshire, and after teaching at a boarding school in New York, he was an associate pastor at the Wellspring Center over in uh, West Lebanon. He lives in Meriden with his wife and child and uh, is currently serving with CU Vox. Christian Union Vox is a Christian leadership development ministry that develops and connects transformative Christian leaders at Dartmouth College and around the country. CU Vox provides intensive small group Bible courses, a weekly lecture series, personal mentoring and discipleship, and opportunities for Dartmouth students to share life and grow in community through social and outreach events. Um, he's going to speak a little bit very briefly during service, and then we would welcome everybody after service to the presentation they'll be giving uh, shortly after we start the fellowship hour. Okay, welcome to the class. Hey folks, it's good to be here today. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Abby, for that kind introduction. And thank you also to Ralph and the rest of the missions committee for supporting us. You know, it's, it's really critical that as uh, members of the community over at Dartmouth that we connect with our local community here because, you know, not only do, you know, we, we have a little impact on our, sort of our insular group there, but we want to have an impact on this area as well. But, you know, Dartmouth actually has an impact worldwide. It's one of the top universities in the world. And although it was founded, as, as many of you know, on Christian principles, on evangelistic principles to educate people, it has strayed uh, very far from that, and not just strayed, but directed itself far away. But, you know, despite this, there is grace, and there is always grace. So Christian Union is a national organization that operates at eight different colleges and universities, uh, and we are intending, uh, as Abby said, to develop and connect transformative Christian leaders. Transformative Christian leaders. We want students who come to Dartmouth to be connected to a compelling Christian community because we recognize that they are the students who will and do change the world. If every business in America goes to Dartmouth to recruit, why would we not want those people to be Christians? If every law school goes to Dartmouth to recruit, if every government organization looks to Dartmouth on every resume, that's who we want to be Christians. And, you know, we want to develop more than just intellectual assent to a set of beliefs. We want to develop a heart that yearns after God and that seeks the Lord day and night. And we'll talk more about that uh, after the service. But you know, we do this through one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. We do it through uh, Bible studies, 
We do it through our weekly uh, large group where we bring in uh, speakers to lecture on, on any number of topics, local pastors, uh, Christian professors, or people who have had success in government or education or law and business uh, and are also Christians and can speak to the intersection of vocation and their faith. And we really have a vision to transform Dartmouth and through that, the world, uh, in, for the glory of God and to bring revival to the campus. So thank you so much for participating in that. Thank you so much for joining with that. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians that, and I'm totally paraphrasing here, but when you give to something that you have a part in it and that you'll be blessed. So thank you so much for, for your support and may God bless you. Uh, welcome, welcome. I'd like to ask our ushers to come, if you would, please, and we'll prepare to receive the morning offering. Thanks, guys. the doxology together. every week we pray that you would bless this and that you would use it to spread your love across the upper valley and across the world and lord we thank you that we get to see this morning just one of the ways you you allow us to do that at, uh, on a mission field about two miles from where we are right now lord we just pray as we see with our eyes where this where this these monies go to be a blessing we are, our faith has increased and we just pray again, Lord, that you would use this, that you would multiply it towards fruit in the world, not fruit for ourselves, but fruit that grows and, and, and it spreads the love of Christ indeed across the upper valley and throughout the world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Except the choir. All the choir members need to remain standing and they're gonna minister to us in music.
in prayer this morning. Lord, we are so truly grateful that we aren't here as this church. Our lives are not some mausoleum for something that happened a long time ago, but you arose, and we have life in the risen Son of God. We thank you, Lord, because it also gives confidence to us when we pray. We aren't praying backwards into the past. We are praying in the present moment to the God who loves us right here and now through the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead right here and now. Lord, we thank you for that confidence. We thank you for that boldness that we can come right to you in Jesus' name. And so we come to you this morning in Jesus' name. There are things on our hearts that weigh heavy, things that on our hearts that we're rejoicing over. We bring them all to you. Lord, we know that you listen when we pray. Lord, we thank you for Marty, who we've been praying for, or we're praying for, had a lung transplant. Uh, this is the second anniversary of that successful lung transplant, and we just want to praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you've, you've done an awesome thing in his life. Lord, we want to pray for those who are waiting for you to do things in their lives, that are looking to you for healing and for comfort and for the relief of pain. Lord, we pray this morning for Becky Luce, who's had to go down to her mother on the vineyard to uh, care for her in her final days. Lord, we pray that you would be with Becky. We pray that you would be with her mother. We pray that you would uh, give her strength. And Lord, we pray that they, in these final moments together, would not only find each other in a close way, but they would find you in that moment in such a dear and precious way. Lord, we pray for Becky, who is also uh, battling cancer herself. We pray, Lord, that you would, that you would just fill her with, the, with your love and your strength now. We pray, Lord, that she would continue to um, be an example uh, to us of what suffering well looks like. Um, the joy that exudes from her is contagious, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that example. Lord, we pray for Beverly Balch, who was diagnosed with brain cancer uh, about a month ago. Lord, we wanna pray for her and for Jeff as they walk through this. Lord, we pray for the continued uh, 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 building up of their faith, even in the midst of doubts and hard questions, Lord. We pray that you would, um, that you would cover them with a grace to know that you can handle all the hard questions you, they could throw at you. Let them know and be convinced every day of your love for them. Lord, we pray for Tara, who is uh, battling trigeminal neuralgia. We pray, Lord, we thank you for the progress she's made, and we pray for a continued progress. Lord, we pray for Marsha Conrad Stone and Mike Conrad. We pray for Captain R in Ukraine, whose brother just died, and the difficult decisions that, um, that Captain R faces uh, as the leader of his, of his, uh, um, uh, his unit there. Lord, we, we, we just pray that you would be with him, and we thank you for the privilege of being connected to someone over there going through these things as they are. Lord, we, we, we know this is a great big world, and if it were left to any one of us, uh, we would be limited by what we can do. But Lord, we are not the creator. You are the creator who is forever praised, and nothing in this world is outside of, your, uh, outside of the reach of your hands. Lord, we thank you that we can be praying here for everything that's on our hearts, big and small, and you can also be listening to other people across the world. You are not limited in your capacity to hear us or to act on our behalf. And so with that great faith and that great confidence, we pray with so much gratitude that this is who you are and this is who you are to us. And so we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The second reading is from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. 
This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The word of the Lord. Let's say this prayer together. Oh, make your word a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip and conversation, that as the rain returns not empty, so neither may your word, but accomplish that for which it is given. Amen. Amen. So I've mentioned to you in the past uh, a trip that I took, but I, I could not, as I was preparing this message this week, I could not uh, help but mention this again. Uh, when we lived in the Netherlands for 10 years and about year two or three, uh, we had to go to a, um, a conference in northern Italy. And you know, there was the, the quick way and then there was the nice way. And so we took the scenic route, we drove there. Um, sounds like a big trip, it was actually only 16 hours if you drove it straight. So um, uh, we figured, oh, we can do it. Um, very nerve wracking the first time you drive across borders in, uh, in Europe, but it was very easy. Uh, so we started out really early in the morning. Charlie must have been, he must have been five and Oliver would have been three. Um, uh, maybe even younger than that. Anyway, we drove through Germany and then we get into Switzerland. And if you have ever been to Switzerland, it is everything the postcards look like. I mean, there was one point we came around this bend and we could see the mountains in the distance. And I was, I was one of those tourists. I like pride myself in not being the tourist in any given place, but we were pulling over every, every couple miles just to take another picture of the same mountain because it was just so gorgeous. At one point we come around this bend and I kid you not, this deep blue, uh, uh, like glass lake with these houses built into the rolling on the hills and, the, and these big snow peaked mountains, I just, I, I felt like I was in a trance somewhere. It just did not seem real. This beautiful green and big and blue and cold, but gorgeous. And it was everything the postcards say they are. And then we came to this place um, as we were going on our journey to the Gothard Road Tunnel. At the time it was built in 1980, it was the longest tunnel in Switzerland. Um, it's like the fifth largest in the world now. It's uh, 10 and a half miles long and it's two lanes the whole way. It's basically a tube that runs through the whole thing. And I think we were in it uh, maybe 25 minutes, maybe close to 30 minutes we were driving through. 
And at first you're like, oh, that's kind of weird, but you got used to it real quick. So we drove through, and as we're getting closer to the other side, obviously we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, because it's, it's later, this might be after lunch. No, it wasn't lunch, because we had to pay a very expensive lunch in Switzerland. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so it was after lunch, and our hearts had recovered from what we shelled out. Uh, we, we're driving through the tunnel, the light is at the end of the tunnel, midday, and we get through the other side and it's just blinding light and then our eyes adjust a little bit and it was like we had landed in another world. We had left big mountains and deep blue lakes and green rolling hills and all that and we came immediately into this Mediterranean paradise looking place. I mean, the differences could not have been more stark. Kind of wet and humid on this side, very dry and like, where's the beach kind of feeling, palm trees. It was just, the difference was startling. And we were still in the same country. In fact, it had even been a little overcast just before we got in, into the tunnel. And then it was this beautiful bright blue sky on the other sides. Um, uh, I'm telling you this story. We're diving into the book of Ephesians now. And when, when Ephesians opens up, Paul is doing the same thing for us that happened in, in the Gothard Tunnel on the other side. He's, he's saying, you're coming now into this life with Christ. He's raised from the dead and you've put your faith in him and you're coming on the other side. And what opens up on the other side of resurrection life as you're living now with Christ is an expansive new world. It is blinding to begin with. You, it, it, there is something, it, you, you can't take it in all at once. You have to kind of like stop and take pictures at certain places because it's just so much in there. And there's a new language there. There's new things that you've never thought of. You don't even have reference points for. And he, he goes through this and actually he just dives right into the deep end, right in the beginning of the chapter, opening it, uh, this new world up to us, kind of defining some of the key moments. We're going to walk through the whole book of Ephesians together. And what we're going to see as we go through that this book um, uh, answers the questions that all of us have, but it answers it from the perspective of seeing life in the resurrected son of God and living that life. It's, it's a beautiful book. I'm so excited to get in, into this with you. Just to kind of give you a sense of, of how big this is, I'm, I'm not the only one who's come up with this. On Wednesdays at Bible study, we're a fan of Eugene Peterson and how he, how he puts things. Um, and uh, oh, that being said, I have to tell you there are two, two books in particular that this week's sermon was very much influenced by, and I would like to recommend them to you. The first is by Eugene Peterson called Practicing Resurrection. He is just, he was such a good writer. Uh, he has a way of putting things, so that's a great one. And then the other one is uh, the what, Ephesians, The Wonder and Walk of Being Alive in Christ. So if you're looking for some in, more in-depth reading, um, that's those two books. You can take a look at them after the service if you want. Uh, Eugene Peterson says this about Ephesians. The sheer size, the staggering largeness of the world into which God calls us, its multi-dimension spaciousness, must not be reduced to dimensions that we are cozily comfortable with. Paul does his best to prevent us from reducing it. Sin shrinks our imaginations. Paul stretches us. He counters with holy poetry. If we calculate the nature of the world by what, what we can manage or explain, we end up living in a very small world. If we are going to grow to the mature stature of Christ, that's a phrase, phrase from Ephesians, we need conditions favorable to it. We need room. The Ephesian letter gives us room, dimensions deep and wide. So as we come through the other side of the tunnel, we've stepped into this resurrection life with Christ. You will ask, and I ask the same question I asked coming through the Gothard tunnel, where are we? This is very strange. Uh, I have no idea what I'm, I, I, I have a little idea of what I'm seeing, but I did not expect this. Where are we? 19 times in these first 14 verses in Ephesians, uh, Christ is mentioned. Uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, you can use a pronoun too, Paul. You don't have to say his name every time. But he just keeps saying these words. He'll say in Christ, through Christ, on Christ, from Christ. He just keeps saying this. And sometimes he says he. Most of the time he's just, he's naming Christ. The most striking words that he repeats in that is in Christ. Where are we? Paul says in this brave new expansive world that you are just beginning to explore, my friends, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Where are you? You are in 
Christ. This is your location. This is your identity now. Now, it's a strange phrase because we would never say of another person that we are in this other person. But as Paul writes this, he was in a prison. He was in a prison and he's saying we are in Christ. That prison was in Rome, but he didn't say we are in Rome. He said we are in Christ. The people who received this letter were in Ephesus. That's why the letter is called the, the letter to the Ephesians. And yet Paul's saying they are in Christ. Christ. And, and I'm in prison and I'm in Rome and, I, and you're in Ephesus, but we are in Christ. Somehow we can be in prison or in Rome or in Ephesus or in Etna, and our lives can still be said to be in Christ at the same time. This is the world that we've entered into. It's a new country, if you will, uh, that our life is now located in. And it's a, it's a way, it's a new way of thinking about what it means to be a follower of the resurrected Son of God. We are not a people gathered in memoriam of a Christ that lived long ago and died and we remember who he is. We're not a people living in reference to him and his teaching as though like this is my life. Uh, yes, I try to do Jesus things every once in a while and that's how it goes. Uh, we are presently, in the present moment, we are alive in the resurrected Son of God. Because he lives, we sang it last week, because he lives, it has an impact on me today because I'm alive in him. So in what way are we in Christ? How, are, how exactly are you and I, though we're here in Etna and Paul's in Rome and, and the Ephesians are in Ephesus and they were there 2,000 years ago, and yet today we can all be said together that we are in Christ. How is that possible? In what way are we in Christ? In every way. Now, initially we'd say, well, in spiritually, in a spiritual way we are in Christ, and you're 100% correct. Spiritually, it says the Spirit of God, and Paul, or Paul talks about this at the end of the verses that we read, that the Holy Spirit was given to us as a deposit of things to come. Like, how do you know you're going to, how does the, um, how does the car dealership know you're going to buy the car that you want? Well, you put a deposit down, right? How, do you, how does the bank guarantee you a certain mortgage? Well, you pay a deposit, and, and you say, here's the deposit. I promise you the rest is coming. In the same way, God looks at us, and we say, God, thank you. We trust in you. Bless is the Son of God. Uh, we're following you. And God says, just so you know that this is all real and that heaven is coming, here's the Holy Spirit. This is what he does for us. So yes, in a spiritual way, our lives are in Christ, but also in a physical, real, kind of dust of the earth kind of way, in the here and now. Now, I love a good verb. Uh, I, I, I relate to them. Verbs are the words, uh, are the words of getting things done. Um, I love verbs so much, sometimes I turn nouns into verbs. Um, uh, you, you know what a verb is, right? It's a, it's a word of action. Teach, dig, call, feed, drive, sleep. And in these verses, Paul is making clear that this new country that's opening up before us, God is doing a lot of doing. In, in fact, God is doing all the doing. He's doing all the verbing, if you will. Well, I want to look with you in the time that we have this morning at, at seven verbs here. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Eugene Peterson actually called them the verbs of God, and I just, it was so good. I almost just wanted to read the book to you at this point. But let me tell you, my own insight is in here too, but I, I have to give credit where credit's due. Let's walk through these seven verbs of God here in Ephesians. Uh, in verse 3, uh, Doug, can you go to the next one? I think the clicker's not working. Oh, okay. Yep, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What's the first verb that God does here? He blesses us in Christ. Blessed. It's interesting to notice that God is blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Again, there's just a whole lot of blessing happening. God, notice that God gives what he is. He is blessed and he gives blessing. He, he blesses us. He, he, God gives what he is and he is what he gives. Um, 
uh, he, uh, Peterson calls this the map and compass of the new world that we're coming into. Do you want to know what it's like? How do you navigate this new world of the resurrected Christ and being in Christ? Well, it begins with blessing. It, you are blessed and God is blessed and he pours out blessings in our lives. This is the beginning place of understanding our relationship with him. Listen, though, to what he's not saying. Paul's not saying here. He doesn't say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who permits us uh, with some spiritual blessing. Or that he kind of ignores us and lets us just come in, uh, uh, and, uh, kind of through the side door. Because he doesn't really want to look at us. But yeah, okay, I'll leave the door unlocked for you. No, he blesses you. You are blessed. The God who made heaven and earth blesses you. There is nothing of stinginess in this word. There's nothing of holding back or reservedness. You are blessed. Verse 4, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be homely, a, a, a holy and blameless before him in love. That second verb is chose. He blessed us. He chose us. You are chosen. You are chosen. I don't know if you ever were... Uh, like playing sports in high school and, or in middle school or in elementary school and, and it, people had to pick teams. Like, you know, like for me, it was basketball. You'd shoot for captains and then the captains would pick people on their teams. You know how much it stinks to be the last person chosen or to not be chosen at all because, well, the teams are full. full sorry, next round. Like that's just a horrible feeling. Um, uh, you don't want to be that person. Paul is saying you're not the last one picked here. You weren't looked over. You're not passed over. You're chosen. From, and look from where. When did he choose you? He didn't choose you when you started acting right. He didn't choose you when you uh, got your life together, when you believed the right things. When he, didn't, he, you didn't even choose, he didn't choose you even when you were born. He chose you before the foundation of the world. You're chosen, but chosen like you've never been before. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Your life is not random. It is designed. You are known. You weren't picked last. You aren't in because he pitied you. No, he chose you. And if you can't get anything else in your heart today, get that, that God chose you. He knows you. He calls you blessed. He calls you his daughter or his son. He chose you. Verse 5. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. Because he wanted to is another way of saying that, I think. He destined. You are blessed. You are chosen. You are destined. It's not only that you are chosen to come out from something, but he's destined you to something. Your life has a purpose. This is the language being destined uh, is the language of, of, of destination. Uh, you are going somewhere. You didn't just come from something. You're going somewhere. It's the language of an appointment. Um, this, this particular passage, and there's a couple other places where Paul mentions this word, has led to a lot of debate. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the word, and perhaps your translation says predestined there. Um, you, can, you can get that from the Greek, but I mean, predestined and destined is pretty much the same thing. It's, it's set in, uh, in advance. Um, people have taken this word out of context here and turned it into abstract, calculating theological debate. Um, they say something like, if God chooses some before the foundation of the world, does he then reject others? Or who are called? How can we know who the called and the destined ones are? But I want you to listen to Paul's words in the context of what he's saying. He is not going into calculating theological debate here. He's going into beautiful adoration and glorious praise. Take heart. You are chosen. Take heart. You are destined. Before the foundation of the world, before you knew to call him by his name, he chose you and he destined you for life as a child of God. Let me go through these quickly. Uh, verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Now, I said that I like verbs. Paul likes verbs, too, because the word he used there, he kind of makes up. He turns, he turns the word grace, the noun grace, into a verb. 
Now, and great, saying something that you are graced with grace, that grace is very elegant, and the word is an, it has nothing to do with elegance. Um, you could say you were begraced, but that doesn't really come across either. The idea is that it, grace is poured out on you, that it's drenched, that it's not held back. And Paul is saying, in this new world that you've entered into, grace is over the top. It, it is exuberant, it's abundant, it's unreserved, it's the blinding light as you come through the tunnel, it's untamed. Uh, that may be difficult for us to get our heads around. After all, that kind of grace is not like the grace where we came from, where you had to earn your way into grace. Or if grace was given, it was given in small amounts. But now we're in a new country, now we're in Christ. There's this beautiful uh, phrase in uh, the series, The Chosen. Um, at the end of season one, uh, Jesus does a weird thing and calls a tax collector to follow him. It's not just in The Chosen, it's also in the scriptures. Uh, but he, uh, he, he, Peter, in the, in, in the artistic rendition of the passage, Peter looks at Jesus and says, uh, Jesus, uh, this is different. And Jesus just looks to him, and this is how season one ends. Jesus just looks at him and says, get used to different. I love that. Now, they've made t-shirts out of that phrase, and I should buy one. Uh, get used to different. Grace, the grace that's available to you on this side of the resurrected life, when you put your faith in Jesus and you are now in Christ, get used to different. It's not like a grace that you have to kind of pitily come up to and say, oh, please give me grace. No, he pours it out on you. It's generous, overflowing. Verses seven and eight, he says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Just another clue there of how much grace there is. And the grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. Here's this other verb, lavished. Again, speaking about grace, it's extravagant. Eugene Peterson says, uh, does Paul overdo it? I don't think so. In matters of grace, hyperboles are understatements. I love that. Ephesians uh, 1, 8 through 9, this grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. He has made it known to us. This is the, the next verb, and we got one more after this. In this new country in Christ, uh, you are not in the dark anymore. It, it, it doesn't matter or it doesn't mean that you immediately have all the answers to all the questions you ever had and that all of your doubts are gone, but it, you, are, you can come with all of your questions and ask like children ask their parents about things. One of my boys is relentless with his questions when he's curious and he just one after the other after the other. And at some point you just want to say, I don't know, because you want the conversation to be done, but he's asking and he's looking at you with those eyes. And so you just got to you just got to give the answer. We can come to him and ask our questions just like that. And why? Because you're a child of God now. You have come through the tunnel. You're a child of God now. Grace is poured out on you. You're blessed. You're chosen. You're destined. You're a child of God. You can ask the questions. And in this new country that you're in, you have a new spirit that's at work inside of you. So if you, if something you couldn't understand, and this is key, and this needs a whole nother sermon, but there are things you couldn't understand on the back side of the tunnel that you'll be able to understand on the front side of the tunnel because a new spirit is at work within you. You couldn't understand something here. It, it felt like, I don't get it, and maybe you brushed it to the side. But on the other side of the tunnel, when you've come into this life and you're into this new country in Christ, all of a sudden you have these like aha moments. And it's just, maybe you just underline a little word in your Bible, or maybe you're praying something, and you're like, oh, I get it now. That's because there's a new spirit at work in you, the deposit for the life that is to come. It doesn't matter how you did in school. Book smarts don't help you in this new country. If you have them, that's great, but you come as you are, and the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is working inside of you. The last verb that Paul brings out here, he says, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is the question, to, or this is the answer to the question, where are we going? Okay, where are we? We're in Christ. 
okay, great. I'm getting a feel for the land now. It's not as bright, like my eyes are adjusting. I'm starting to understand a few things. Where actually are we going? Paul says it here. We've come through the tunnel into this wide new expanse of world. And we're looking at all the verbing God does and how strikingly little verbing we do in this relationship. God is blessing. God is calling. God is destining. God is doing all of this work. But where's this going to take me? Where am I actually going? I'm, I mean, the car's in motion. I'm on the move here. Life is going on. I've got a lot of verbing to do too. Where are we going to go moving forward? Paul says he gathers up all things in him and Christ. So where are we going? We're going more and more into Christ. He'll talk about this later as uh, maturing into the full stature of Christ or maturing as people of the resurrection who are now in Christ. Another way of saying it, we're becoming more and more like spitting images of our Father in heaven. C.S. Lewis, at the last, uh, the last of his Narnia series, uh, The Last Battle, they get, into this new, they get into Aslan's country. And it's this, again, a wide expanse of world. And one of the characters, at one point, they're just at the edge of it. And they, he just decides to start going, run, run off deeper into this new life that he has. And he yells back to his friends, further up and further in. There's more to see. We're, we've got more to explore. There doesn't seem to be an end to the horizon of where we could possibly go further up and further in. That's where we're going. There is no end to this life in Christ. Christ isn't our ticket to heaven. He is the destination himself. In Christ, the journey is the destination. You will never be farther. You will never, once you are beginning this life in Christ and journeying in it, you never go so far as to not be in Christ anymore. Like, you are a Christ person. Christian means little Christ. Like, it's written, it's coded into our new DNA as children of the, of, of the high God of heaven, that we are now in Christ. And the only place to go, truly, is further up and further in. There's more to see. There's more to experience of the world, of God, of what he's doing in our lives, of, of the blessings he speaks out over us, of the, the way he's helping us navigate all of the, the, the difficulties of our lives. And, and guess what? He didn't call us alone because he's brought us friends and family who are on this journey with us to go together. Paul will talk about all of this in the coming chapters of Ephesians. Today is all about orientation, knowing that we have come through the tunnel and we're looking at this new life in Christ and see how this is defined, that you are blessed, you are chosen, you are destined. He has bestowed, he has begraced you, he has poured out grace on you, he has lavished grace on you. He has made known to you the mystery of what he's doing, and he has gathered everything up into Christ, because in him the journey is truly really the destination. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you for the blinding light that enters our lives when we come to faith in you. Oh, I thank you, Lord, that you don't just leave us in the blinding light, but you have shown us what is there in this new place of life in Christ. And I pray, God, that you would help us to let this new world uh, uh, fall into our experience today. I pray that you would reorient our hearts, reorient our vision, help us to see and to be able to articulate all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, and we pray for your spirit to continue to do the work of leading us further up and further in. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand with me and let's sing one final hymn as we close out our time together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights? 
commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever block me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Lord, we do thank you. We do praise you. We are alive in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And I pray that as we go from here, you would lead us on further up and further in. So church, I bless you now in the name of your Father in heaven who loves you more than you could ever imagine. In the name of Jesus Christ, who himself is the sign and seal of that love and the one come to not only show us the way, but to be the way. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the presence of God, walking with you, working in your lives to lead you home. Walk with him today and in all your days to come until the day that Jesus Christ returns for us, because as sure as he is risen, he will surely come again. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday. Uh, refreshments are in Trumbull Hall, and uh, there's going to be a presentation from our friends in about 10 minutes. Uh, so God bless, and thanks to everybody joining us online. God bless. God bless.